he's up there working two rooms, so that's part of the reason why the sound is hot when he's on one board, he can't be on the other one at the same time. So um, if I start sounding real loud, I'll just back up. Shalom to you now, shalom, my friends. May God's full mercies bless you, my friends, in all your living and through your loving. Christ be your shalom, Christ be your shalom. At nearly every funeral or memorial service over which I've been privileged to provide, preside, I offer to the congregation that gathers there in this song. It's found on page 6666 in our United Methodist Hymnal. It's a mean pronouncing and proclaiming a conclusion, a benediction, a blessing over all that has gone before in the service. Paul, in the eighth chapter of his great Romans letter, asks, what then are we to say about all these things? He asks this question in response to his own reflection on suffering and sorrow and its predominance in human life. The words of that song then are meant to be a prayer, a prayer that pleads with God on behalf of oneself and others that there at the graveside, as we prepare to commend our loved one over to the embrace of God, that there would be for us in that place a sense of shalom, of peace, of fulfillment, of satisfaction. Jesus from the cross said, it is finished, not a cry of despair or of dereliction, but a cry of victory. At the grave, we too celebrate that cry. Christ has finished our suffering. Shalom is our, will want our walk in life. Peace, fulfillment. It is that gift of peace that Jesus leaves behind for us in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John as he speaks to his disciples, to us as well, on the night before he dies. Peace I leave with you, he says. My peace I give to you. He grants them, he grants us, a gift that flows from the core of his own self, from his very heart, that gift of grace and peace and mercy and shalom. I do not give to you as the world gives, those false gifts of perceived power and presumed peace which cannot be sustained and will not satisfy. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he concludes, and do not let them be afraid. This is the gift which has sustained the church through centuries of woe and millennia of wrong, the gift of peace, of shalom, that completion, that satisfaction, that good which was present in the beginning of the creation of all things, but which was confounded by the effects of human sin. God sends the gift again in Christ Jesus, who leaves behind for his followers, for you, for me, for us, Shalom, to show, to share, peace. Peace that lifts us up from our beds at the beginning of the day and sets us on our feet filled with purpose and power and praise. Peace that accompanies us as we make our way through the days of our lives, as we carry on and carry out those tasks which are ours, that mission given to us as the body of Christ, as the people of God. Peace that allows us to lie down at the end of the day, knowing at the onset of the night that we are gently held in the secure embrace of a loving God who protects and preserves us even as we give ourselves to rest, to sleep. Here is the peace, the gift which Christ grants to his followers, to us, grants to us in a way which is not that as the way the world gives. Such is the gift as well that allows us to remain at peace with one another and with others, even in the face of forces that threaten to tear us apart, to rend us asunder, to bring the fear of separation and schism into the very heart and core of the body of Christ. Such a force, I suspect, will be at work when lay and clergy delegates of the United Methodist Church gather later this month in Portland for our general conference, making plans, setting policies, settling disputes, charting out a course for the church's work in the world for the next four years. 
debates on that occasion over the vitality of our denomination, over the viability of institutions, over the faith of churches and congregations and clergy as well to the changes taking place in our culture, particularly those which focus on the issues of human sexuality, these are among the issues which will be facing us, those which the world hopes will bring the church to separation, to schism, to division, to despair. Joe Yackel has been dwelling among us incognito. Joe is a retired bishop in the United Methodist Church. When I met him two years ago, he said, call me Joe. Don't tell anyone what I've done. Well, I'll tell you what Joe has done. Joe has been a voice of reason, a voice of uh, unity, a, a voice of calm in the midst of the struggles of the United Methodist Church as a, as a bishop since 1970, I think you said. 72, elected to the first class in the United Methodist Church of Bishops. Joe was there in the beginning, and Joe will be uh, going to General Conference as, as a retired bishop, as a, they call you guys potted plants behind the podium, um, sadly, but as a leader of the church in uh, next weekend and the following and the following. We, we send with Joe our well wishes, our Godspeed, our prayers and our blessings, and pray that you would continue to be that source and force of calm and unity in the face of all that faces us. Today, we gather, you and me, and all those who come to this table. We gather at a common table to share in a single supper, a supper which presents us with bits of broken bread and mouthfuls of poured out wine, a tiny foretaste of that vast feast which we will eat together with all God's people at the banquet table in the New Jerusalem, that city in which, as John the seer puts it, there will be no need of sun or moon to shine, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb, the Lamb who was slain, the Lamb who willingly gave up life itself for the sake of the other, for us, for all. The Lamb is the one who has called us to this place, to this purpose, whose light enlightens us as we seek to be a people of shalom and to be open in mind and spirit as this table is open to whomever might come and gather with us here. Elizabeth Johnson writes, Shalom signifies more than the absence of conflict. Indeed, and in fact, true shalom, true peace, rises up and serves as the divine response to human conflict. More than this, she says, shalom is a profound and holistic sense of well-being, that wellness which is ours because of the action of the Holy Spirit. And are we yet alive and see each other's face? Glory and thanks to Jesus give for his almighty grace. These words first penned by Charles Wesley in 1749 and then appropriated by his brother John to be sung for the society at meeting. These words were sung whenever his followers gathered for prayer and praise, for worship and work, for study and service, for conversation and holy conferencing. For nearly 250 years then, whenever United Methodists have come together to discuss the issues that trouble them, the challenges that face the church over the centuries, whenever we gather, we sing this song. Preserved by power divine to full salvation here, again in pre Jesus' prayer, join and in his sight appear. The hymn reminds us that the peace which has been given to us, comes not from ourselves, not from our own storehouse, but from the storehouse of another, from the vast provision of God, who alone through Jesus Christ has made possible human salvation, and who is activating us for divine purposes through the power and the persistence of the Holy Spirit. What troubles have we seen? What mighty conflicts past, fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. Yet out of all the Lord hath brought us by his love, and still he doth his help afford and hides our life above. My prayer this day is that this Lord's table and the feast set upon it 
may serve to remind us, as it reminds all of those who gather in places like this, that the gift which is ours through the grace of Jesus Christ is a gift of peace, of shalom, of profound well-being, that which is ours because of the words and the works of the one who has called us by name, the one after whose name we who are Christian have been called. Then let us make our boast of Christ's redeeming power, which saves us to the uttermost till we can sin no more. Let us take up the cross till we the crown obtain and gladly reckon all things lost so we may Jesus gain. And so I pray. Jesus, to thee we bow. And for thy coming wait, give us for some good token now in our imperfect state, apply the hallowing word, each who looks for thee, thou shalt be perfect as thy Lord, thou shalt be all like me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia. As the ushers prepare to assist us, I want to lift this, um, this word of thanksgiving before you. A generous gift was recently received from the estate of Shirley Michener to the Facilities Fund of our church. We want to thank Shirley and her family for this gift. And if you might be interested in adding Worcester United Method to your will, I advise you to, to uh, consult your appropriate financial or legal advisor. Gifts like this allow us to be assured that the work of Christ is carried on in this place and the purposes of God achieved. Thanks be to God for the gifts of God's people. The ushers are now prepared to assist us as we respond to God's graciousness through the giving and receiving of our tithes and offerings. <laughs> 